please join me in the prayer for illumination. <clears throat> Open, Lord, my eyes that I may see. Open, Lord, my ears that I may hear. Open, Lord, my heart and mind that I may understand. So shall I turn to you and be healed. Amen. Here a reading from the Gospel of St. Luke, reading from the 24th chapter and reading verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked him, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things that took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had made known to them in the break been made known to them in the breaking of bread. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right. Can y'all hear me okay? Good. First of all, I want to thank y'all for having me. It's such a delight to, uh, to get to be in the church. Um, I serve in campus ministry, so my life is surrounded with young people who are full of energy and crazy and... Um, wonderful all at the same time, but it's a much uh, different kind of ministry in many ways. Um, I, I like to tell my, uh, uh, I like to tell people that my students are allergic to morning. Um, so, you know, so to be up and get to worship on Sunday with folks is, is nice because a lot of times our worship services are at night, um, well into the night sometimes. So my eyes often look like the color of the flowers. Uh, but it's a good, a good ministry and one that we need to continue to do because we want to reach that generation with the gospel of Christ. We just got to do it. It's our, it's our, it's our job. 
um, and, and our joy. Amen. Um, all right. Well, we today are going to look at the familiar story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. How many of y'all know this story? You guys have heard this story before, probably a million times. Um, I love this story. It's one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think it's near to me because I'm one of those people that often goes through life getting consumed by things. How many of y'all have ever had the experience of driving along in your car, okay, and all of a sudden you look up and you're like, where am I? Have you done this? Have you done this? Or how about you're in your house and you're, you know, you're in the living room and you're walking to the kitchen and you walk into the kitchen and, and what do you say? What, why did I come in here? Have you ever done this? Why? And how is it you forget from the, it's like one, re, I mean, it's like here to here, <laughs> you know, how is it you forget so quickly? Um, but we do that sometimes, don't we? We get like these disciples on the road to Emmaus, and we get so tuned into, in, turned inward, really. I think locked into some kind of thought process. And so, what these guys are obsessing over, if you will, what they're locked onto in their minds is the events of the last few days. All right. And so, what we have is um, we just had the crucifixion, we just had the resurrection. But they haven't really experienced their Easter moment yet because they're not aware of it, right? They haven't, it hasn't come together for these two people walking to Emmaus. So what they're focused on is, oh my goodness, can you believe how awful the things that have happened to this man that was so promising. We had this guy come into our midst. They call him a prophet. We had such hopes for him. And what happens? The authorities, the rulers crucify him. And in that moment, they lose, they lose hope. Uh, and then what happens? It even says that, that they're aware of these stories. The women among them had gone to the tomb and came back and said all this stuff about, oh, he's not there. And, but they're still down and out, right? It's interesting to me that, you know, they've heard this. They, they, uh, you know, I, they're curious about it, but they haven't allowed it to, to change their thinking. They're still in a bad place. Because it says they're walking along together and Jesus comes up to them and they are sad. They're very sad. And it says they stop. You know, and I can just imagine they're processing. Amen. They're processing the events. And I can just almost see them looking at their feet. Oh, and this stranger comes up and they say to him, haven't you heard what has happened? Are you the only person that hasn't heard the events of the last few days? How could you not have heard what they did to Jesus, this man that had so much promise, so much hope, so much everything and that we had so placed our hope in, has been crucified and he's gone. And they're saying this to none, none other than who? <laughs> I like the way they give the bad news to the good news. Right Here they are telling Jesus, the risen Jesus, the bad news. Poor, oh, how could you not know this guy? You know, They have no idea who's standing in their midst. No idea. Their eyes are closed, the story says. All right, so I know our scripture says that the trip to Emmaus was about seven miles. I was doing a little bit of research to try to figure out exactly how far it is from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And no one really exactly knows, but from what I read, it's anywhere from 6 to 18 miles. Oh my goodness, 18 miles. I can't even imagine. I've got some friends who just did the Ironman, which has like a marathon at the end and stuff like that. And, you know, when I look at those guys, I'm like, that's crazy. Like, I can't even, you know, I do good to get from my car to the office to the, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, Beth walked from the parsonage here, and I was like, high five, girl. <laughs> it's not that far, but I was like, yeah, you go. Mm-hmm. That's exercise. Six to 18 miles. And I can imagine it probably wasn't, I mean, they didn't have the same kind of things that we have. They probably had this rough path, you know. Uh, they didn't have pavement back then. You know, it wasn't uh, oil slick roads or anything like that. <clears throat> they did not have... Um, they didn't have uh, Nike shoes like we have, 
or a New Balance or whatever. I'm sure they had some uncomfortable sandals, and they're trekking down the road, you know, uncomfortably walking in, in this dust with this man moping and sad. Um, and, of course, we know that they, they say these things to Jesus about how awful things are and how he needs to be made aware of them because how could he have not known? Uh, and I love the fact, the irony of the part where Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you people are. And he says this kind of stuff every now and then to his disciples. Uh, I mean, I'm not feeling the love right there. <laughs> he says they're foolish. He, t- he says they're slow. Not the most flattering things to say to people. But he tells them that, you know, you guys, I can almost imagine him saying that. Y'all, come on. Ugh. And then he starts walking through the history All the scriptures, these are the things the prophets have said to us over the years. These are the things that point to something different than what you're describing. And let me explain it and how it unfolds for you people, you know. So he takes them back to the beginning and explains what's really going on. But there's still, these these folks, these disciples, they're still locked in. Because you don't hear them rejoice. You don't hear them have that aha moment just yet. So they continue on this long journey, this you know, six, seven, 18 mile trek to Emmaus. And when they get to Emmaus, they're still you know, uh, probably down in the mouth. And they invite Jesus to stay with them uh, because it's getting late. And ask Him to have a meal together. And of course, it's in that moment that they suddenly have that aha, that aha moment that we all so long for and need in our, our spiritual lives um, more than anything. Um, you know, Christianity is a lot of things, uh, but one thing it is not is um, a sedentary faith. You know, I, I think it's amazing that over and over again we read so much about how it's an adventure, a journey, a walk, a race, a marathon, a, um, you know, all these action words that compel us to go out and do something. We read over and over again about the, the Great Commission. You know, we find it in, in all the Gospels, in some way, shape, or form, we find the Great Commission. We are called to go out and do something, we're called to go out and make disciples. For the transformation of the world, which is what our our Methodist mission states. Of course, the Great Commission tells us to make disciples and grow them as disciples. Teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go, go, go. It tells us over and over again. And I like the fact that these disciples, after this horribly long journey um, and this amazing revelation, have this incredible aha moment with the Lord. And what do they do? Do they stay put for the night? No. And I would imagine they were tired. But instead of staying put for the night, instead of thinking it over, uh, what do we do next? Or, you know, pondering it some more, having a second course of meal, whatever, uh, taking a nap. It says that they turned around and headed back. And it was already late. It didn't matter. They knew that they needed to go. They had a purpose. They had a plan. They needed to get back to the other disciples and proclaim the good news and point them to something amazing that was happening. Um, now that they were awakened, they wanted to make sure everyone knew what was going on. And so what did they do? They went. They went, they went, they went. And so, brothers and sisters, as people who are called to go, I'm going to challenge us to do something interesting today. Uh, last, my volunteer, I see Corbin stepped out. Do you have any more kiddos? Is mine here? Back, back row, Hunter. Okay, come see. I am going to get him to hand out these little papers for you guys. And we're going to do something just a tiny bit different today, all right? All right, just start handing them. Actually, if you want to hand this one to Mr. Lucas, right? Okay, hand that to Mr. Lucas, and he could probably pass those back. I'm going to hand these around, and I'm going to read a little story to you guys, and we're going to do something unusual today in worship. Yeah, I can imagine having Pastor Don. You guys are used to unusual. <laughs> so that's good. You might need your pew pencils. I'll just give you a heads up. So go ahead and pass those out. All 
Okay, as he's passing those out, I'll direct you to the screen behind me. This is um, a, the cover of the Dr. Seuss book, Oh, the Places You'll Go. How many of you guys are Dr. Seuss fans? Anybody? Oh, I love him. He's so great. Um, Green Eggs and Ham, my favorite. It's so good. Cat in the Hat, great movie, great book. I just love his work. It speaks to it speaks to us on so many levels. Um, but he wrote this particular book called "Oh, the Places You'll Go." Um, do we need some more? Okay, uh, look down there, Dawn, underneath that chair, probably top. This particular book has been read at things like graduation services. Um, different things like that, and I think you'll see why. All right, so all the places you'll go. This is a little excerpt from it. Congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what, what you know. And you are the guy who will decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets. Look them over with care. About some you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not-so-good street. Thank you, buddy. And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there in the wide open air. Out there things can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along. You'll start happening too. Oh, the places you will go. Brothers and sisters, I've handed out a little question air and what I'd like for us to do today is is a little bit different than your average sermon you're going to interact a little bit right um I know for some people that's a bit uncomfortable so if you don't if you're in that weird place where you're just like I just need to be quiet and not talk to these people around me that's okay I'm okay with that I want to go ahead and affirm you in your position on that um if you can interact with others around you I think that's great that's helpful uh I want you guys to answer these questions for yourselves, and you can write down your answer. You can draw a picture. You can do whatever you want. Or you can use the front, the back. Um, but try to ask yourself to really answer these things honestly from your heart. This is how we connect with God in, some, in many ways, is, is the times when we stop for a moment and have that aha. And so I want you guys to, to try to give yourselves a little aha space today and answer a few questions. And the first question I'd like for you to answer is this, just kind of an opening statement, an opening question to get us thinking. If you could go anywhere, anywhere you wanted, and time and money were not a factor, where would you go and why? So I'm going to give you a moment to think about that. Any answers okay? If you want to go to Hogwarts and Oz, whatever, even if it's not a real place, just think about it. Where would you go? If, if anything, sky's the limit, you know? What would that look like? Allow yourselves to just go there in your mind. Take a moment to write that down and think about it. Now, don't tell each other where to go. <laughs> we, we've that's, already been that's, here. That's, that's not okay. <laughs> All right, I've given you guys a little bit of a moment. Who would be brave enough to say to say a place that they might want to go? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Bon Bon Germany. Ooh, Bon Bon Germany. Oh, wow. To go to the place of your ancestors. That is really neat. That's cool. Time and money are not a, not an issue. Where would you go? Oh, San Marcos. 
Yes, ma'am. And maybe float down it in an inner tube. That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Ooh. I love it. See the earth. How amazing is that? Just to travel all over the world. Time, no, time and money are no issue. That would be incredible. Ooh. Mars. Hey, dream big. That's a good one. <laughs> that is out in this world. <laughs> Yeah, see if there's any boldly go where no man has gone before. I hear you. That's right. That's right. I like it. The swimming's better in Cancun than Mars. It is. Yeah, and the air is much, much better, right? Oh, yeah, it's nice. Hey, Hunter, where would you like to go? Colorado. We've been to Colorado. It's super nice. Did you have one to you? Oh, amen, amen. Being with family, that's an adventure in and of itself, right? All right. Very good, good responses. Is there anybody else that wants to chime in a little? Anybody? All right. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, you do, Beth. And I would like to go, too, (laughs) with you guys. Good answer. All right, y'all. Now, let's let's take a look at this second question. And y'all are going to keep these papers. These are for y'all to keep and take home. Because I want you to ch- I want to challenge you guys to dream. This is about dreaming big and not letting the circumstances in our immediate sight contain and confine us and dictate what we have to do. All right? So number two, who is a part of your community? Who influences you and who do you influence? Who do you encounter on a daily basis? So kind of jot that down. Hang on, buddy. Let's give everybody a few minutes just to kind of wrestle with that. All right, and now I want to give you a moment to kind of talk with the people who are near to you and say out loud to them who you think is part of your your community or who you have a chance to influence. Y'all go ahead and discuss among yourselves for a second. I'll be talking out loud on the mic.
All right. Did y'all have a chance to kind of talk over who you have the opportunity to influence? Um, let's let's have a few people answer this. Prayer group. That's a good one. They influence you, and you have the opportunity to influence them. Yes, ma'am. I hear you. They are very helpful to most of our lives. God and Jesus are in your community. I can't think of a better answer than that. That's a good one. <laughs> Do you go to school? All right. And your that's right, your family. Mhm. That's right. How many of y'all have uh, groups that you get together with during the week that are, you know, maybe a Lions Club or a um, Domino's or a coffee drinking McDonald's group or you know something like that. I like those groups a lot. Those are those are places where you have influence, aren't they? Our schools, our jobs, our our friends, our circles of our neighborhoods. Um, I we drove through a bunch of neighborhoods here, and I was impressed at at how many cool places there are here in Bris- Brazoria. Uh, there's a shopping area, there's that train museum area, there's, you know, parks, beaches, there's a lot of places where I suppose you could get together with folks and have influence over them and then have influence over you. That's a good, that's good to open our eyes and look around at what's in, in our midst. All right, now let's look at the last question. And this one gets a little more personal, all right? Just going to say, this one is the one that I really want y'all to think about and pray about as you uh, just take a moment Where is God leading you? What places or experiences might God want you to explore? Give that some thought for just a moment. And let me say there's no exemptions. Where's God calling you as, a, as an individual? Sometimes my students in college ask me, how do I know what God's will is for my life? And I always tell them, you know, God's not hiding that because God wants you to do it. God's going to make it clear to you whatever his will is for your life. Sometimes that looks like, you know what, I have the ability to play piano. So maybe God's will is for you to use it to his glory. Amen. Maybe you have the ability to sing or to preach or to speak or to help or to, you know, do a million different things. Whatever those gifts and graces God has given you, God wants you to use those things for his glory and his kingdom. It's just that simple. Other times God places opportunities in our lives. Y'all, what a wonderful thing it was for you guys to take time to write on those little strips of paper. And I know it didn't seem like much, but if you've gone through a horrible crisis like a tornado that has destroyed a huge part of your community, to feel the love and prayers of others is so important. What a gift. And so what God sometimes calls us to do is to respond to the situations that pop up in our lives in ways that we can. And you did that this morning. That's what that was all about. That is God's will for your life. It's God's will for your life to follow the great commandment, to go and make disciples, to do the things it says in the Bible, love others and to love him in. That's just God's will. And so when you think about what God's calling you to do, it doesn't matter who you are, what place you are in life, how much you have to give, what your resources are, how old you are, how young you are, how much you think you have inside to give, God is still calling you to do ministry with whatever that is. Whatever that is. And I want to tell you a little story. I'm not going to ask you all to respond to that last question out loud. I really want that to be between you and God and for you to prayerfully take hold of it. But I want to tell you for just a moment a a little story about my own personal calling and the journey that I've had in campus ministry. I started off in campus ministry a little over eight years ago, about eight years ago. And the building that I 
did this campus ministry out of was on campus at, at Tyler Junior College. And it was an old, dilapidated building. It's, it was probably built in the 19, early 1960s, I think. And the last time it had maintenance on it was probably around 62 or 3. Um, so for, f- f- you know, f- however long that is, I can't do math. But <laughs> we, we, can't, we can't imagine. Okay, for, for a period of time, there was no maintenance on this building. A long period of time. Y'all, and let me, and to, make, to drive it home, let me explain to you. We had, in the men's room in our building, the urinal didn't work, and I had no idea how to fix it because, well, I don't have that skill set. Where's the plumber? I could have used him. Yes, I wish I'd have had you. <laughs> I wish I had had you at my building because we had so many plumbing issues. It was a disaster. So we had a non-working urinal in the bathroom. We had... Um, uh, uh, the floors and the furniture and stuff were so filthy. One time we rented one of those, um, those like vacuum, like, what do you call those things? Steam cleaners. Okay, we got one of those steam cleaners with 50 bucks, whatever, rented that thing for the day. Okay, when we dumped the water out, have y'all, have y'all ever had that drink called Yoo-Hoo? Yeah. Yoo-Hoo? It's like chocolate milk, but it's cold or whatever, like a soda. Y'all, it was, that's what the water looks like from the bucket when we dumped it out. It was, fil- it was a filthy building. Um, at one point, I noticed there was a leak coming out of the closet where the water heater was. And at this point, I decided the building was mad at me. Um, there was a leak coming out underneath the, the door. And so I called the plumber and I said, we got to get somebody out here to fix this building. It's a disaster or fix this water heater. And I opened up the closet and you couldn't even get to the water heater because there's stuff piled everywhere. So I started taking things out. And as I'm taking things out, a swarm of wasps comes out of the closet right, right at me. And I, and I happen to have a broom in my hand. So I'm like, yeah! you know, I'm swinging the broom, swinging the broom. And as I'm swinging the broom, I took a big step back, slipped in the water, and the broom hit the window, broke the window. And it was just like, it was one thing after another, like constant battle with this building. I was just like, I hate this building. Anyway, so as if that wasn't enough, um, it was just hard to do ministry in that particular location. Um, it was kind of like, we called it down the hill. It had no curb appeal. I just learned that term recently, curb appeal. We didn't have that. Um, it was like a dumpy place that no one wanted to go to. So for ministry's sake, it was hard to do ministry. No one wants to go in this dumpy building. Anyway, so we had no money. A green campus minister. I mean, I had only just been commissioned. We had real. Uh, the conference decided they weren't going to support us anymore because they didn't think we were worth it. <laughs> you know, they thought, well, we don't have enough people coming to justify keeping giving you money. Uh, so they didn't pay me hardly anything. I didn't have benefits, none of that kind of stuff. Go in there, and you know, I'm like, this is impossible. This is so impossible. And you know why I thought it was impossible to do anything with that place? Because I was like these disciples on the road to Emmaus. All I could see was this, and I was consumed with it. I could just see what was right in front of me, and I didn't think there was any way to make it any different. I didn't see hope. I did not see hope in that situation. Well, y'all, apparently God saw things differently. And you know, as Methodists, we talk about this thing called prevenient grace. We believe that God is doing something in our midst already before we even show up. All right? That's what prevenient grace is. Prevenient grace is the fact that God's reaching out, God's active, God's, um, you know, at work, and then we are called to participate in it, whatever that is that God's doing. And we're wooed into it, we're lured into it, we're loved into it. Uh, God was at work in the surroundings, in the campus ministry that I was involved in. And so what ended up happening is our board decided, you know what, we're going to do something different. We're going to try to get rid of this building, and let's look at an incredibly new style of ministry in which we actually house college students in a Christian community together while they're in college. All right, well, we didn't have any money to do this, okay? And we're talking, it's an expensive endeavor to build a dormitory, But you know what? God had a plan. We worked it out with the college. We got together against impossible odds on a secular campus where, you know, they don't want Jesus, quite frankly. Um, We met with the president of the college, and he said, you know what? We like having you all around. You provide free meals every week. You all pray for us and whatever you do over there. We like you guys. So how about we swap buildings because we like your property. 
We swapped buildings for a dorm that they already had built. We got grant money from people. $150,000 worth of grant money. That's a God thing. We got churches like Grand Celine to come over um, and build things for us so that we could do the ministry we wanted to do. They put in pavers. They put in counters. They built picnic tables. They did all kinds of amazing stuff. And y'all, let me tell you, there were so many hurdles to cross. We had to go through lawyers. We had to get money. We had to beg and borrow. We had to come up with rules and restrictions and guidelines and and application processes to put different roommates together. It was so much work and so much stuff. But every step of the way, God made it possible. And I think so often, when I think about the Easter story, I think I identify so much with standing on the one side of the stone. How often do we do that, right? We're standing on the side of the stone, not in the tomb, but on the outside of the tomb, looking at this giant rock that is impossible to move, that's impossible to penetrate. It's over. There's no more hope. There's nothing. And yet, what God's at work doing on the other side that we can't see is incredible. And that's where the hope comes in. And I think it's so great that in our story uh, on the walk to Emmaus that that Jesus is right there with them, journeying with them alongside of them and in their midst. And it's wonderful that in the end of that story, they have that moment where they realize there he is and that all that hope hasn't been lost, that God has a plan and a purpose. And they're going to go out and they're going to do what they got to do. And he's going to send them. And brothers and sisters, I hope you stay for lunch because we're going to talk some more. But oh, the places you will go. Oh, the places you will go.